Good morning. If you would, grab a Bible. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, where we will begin our period of study here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Good to see everyone this morning, and uh, we are... Blessed to have uh, been spared some of the weather that hit other parts, and, uh, but we're thankful that we're able to be here together. I just want to remind you that if you're ever at any point in this sermon looking at your watch, and it feels like it's a little later than normal, and maybe the preacher is going on and on, just remember we started 10 minutes late. So I get a free 10 minutes, right? I think we should all agree to that. I don't know, I don't hear a lot of uh, amens about that, so maybe I should just get to it. Good to see everyone this morning. Good to see we have visitors with you. We want you to feel welcome, and we're glad that you're here as well. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, the text says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So this passage speaks to the kind of spirit that should exist among Christians, particularly men and women. He says in verse 8 that men are to be prayerful, holy, and peaceful. Women, he says, are to be modest, self-controlled, and adorned in good works. But in setting this tone, in talking about how Christians should live, Paul mentions specifically how we dress. That what we wear matters because it is something that should be given thought by us about how we are presenting ourselves to the world. I have been asked to talk about how Christians should dress. What does the New Testament teach about what we should wear as Christians? And that's a hard topic. I think there's an obvious difficulty in that when you think about it, which I have been doing, because dress is uniquely tied to culture. Styles attractiveness, what is appropriate, even what is considered revealing, changes depend on, depending on the time and place where you are. Those things are all a function of the culture in which we live. So it seemed to me, as I was thinking about how to present something that would deal with and talk about how Christians should dress, that the best way to frame it is not trying to look at exactly wear this, don't wear this, or exactly how to cover ourselves, but to ask three questions. So what I want to do is ask the question, as we talk about what shall we wear, three questions that we should think and ask ourselves before we prepare ourselves to go out among other people. The first question is, what is appropriate? What is appropriate? That's the first question I want us to ask. As we go to our closets, or if you keep all your clothes on the floor, like I used to do when I was in college, as you go to your floor and you're going to get your clothes and decide what you're going to wear for the day, what is appropriate for a Christian man or woman to wear? And as I understand it, there are two dangers in the way the Bible describes dress. That there is the danger of overdressing, that is dressing in ways that are intended to draw attention to ourselves by being inappropriate by too much, or by underdressing, that is by clothes that reveal too much. So let's look first at this passage that we begin with, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9. Paul writes, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now there are two words in this text that speak about what we would call the idea of appropriateness. One is the word, in my version it's the word respectable, there in verse 9, respectable. Yours might have modest, or the New American Standard has proper, but you can hear in that all of the idea of appropriateness. What is proper, or what is respectable? The other word is in verse 10, where Paul writes, what, with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So, proper or appropriate, if you're reading another version, these are all the same question, what is appropriate? And the point is that there are some things that Christians just shouldn't wear because they're not appropriate. They don't fit, and we're not really talking here about fitting the, the event we're going to or fitting the expected dress code. We're talking about they don't fit with Christian character. They're not appropriate for what a Christian should be doing or showing about themselves. But in this text, the danger that we're talking about is the danger of overdressing. 
That is what modest means in verse 9. In verse 9 he says, with modesty and self-control. The New American Standard says modestly and discreetly. The NIV says with decency and propriety. And then he says, look again at verse 9. Then he says that Christians should not dress with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So this is about dressing in a way that draws attention to me. So I want to present myself in a way that everybody will look at me and notice me and think good things about me because of how nice I look. We're showing off. Now I mentioned at the beginning that dress is cultural. And you can see that in some of these things, right? In verse 9, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire. Now, gold and pearls still draw a lot of attention. I'm not sure braided hair does in the same way that evidently in whatever way it did in the the, uh, Greco-Roman world. But the point he's making really is independent of those specifics, isn't it? He's just telling us to ask the question, what is appropriate when you get dressed for the day? What are you doing and what are you thinking about as you dress? And he says in verse 10, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. See, by contrast to to being flashy in our appearance, Christian women dress themselves or adorn themselves with good works. That is, they don't draw attention to themselves because of what they wear. They draw attention to themselves because of who they are. That's what draws people to them. And he says, let that be the kind of life you're presenting, not just the way you present your body. Now, what I am saying is Paul's line of thinking here should influence the way we dress. That's what it's intended to do. That there are ways we should not dress, and then there are ways we should present ourselves that are about more than dress. Let's go over to 1 Peter 3. You can tie these two passages together. They're very similar, although Peter has a little bit of a different focus. 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. 1 Peter 3 and verse 3 says, Do not let your adorning adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So he says in verse 3, don't let your adorning be merely external. That is, don't let the body be the focus of who you are and who you present to other people. Now he also mentions, just like Paul did, he mentions braiding hair and he mentions jewels, but he doesn't say not to wear those things. In verse 3, instead he says, braiding hair, putting on gold jewelry, and the clothing you wear. One of them is clothing, so he's obviously not saying don't wear clothing. What he is saying is, these are things that the specifics show Peter's concern about thinking attractive dress and making ourselves look impressive is what's important about us. And he says, that's not who you are. Don't let it be the external that matters to you. Now, this passage, in my view, also seems to be about overdressing. It also seems to be about drawing attention to my body in the way I present myself. I want people to notice me. When I have been somewhere, I want everybody to know. And he says, Christians are not that way. We're not trying to impress people by the way we dress. We're not going to overdress. So what is appropriate? Am I going to outdress everybody else so that everyone will be impressed with me? That is inappropriate. Now I said that there are two ways the Bible describes inappropriate dressing. The other is not overdressing, but what we might call underdressing. I don't mean that we show up in clothes that are not nice enough. When I talk about underdressing, I'm talking about not covering up enough of our our bodies. And there are places in the Bible that warn us about the danger of underdressing. I want you to go with me back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, where in the Garden of Eden, it just so happens that there are no clothes, and then suddenly there are clothes. Genesis chapter 2, which describes how God made man and woman... And this statement is made in Genesis 2.25, just sort of out of the blue at the end of the chapter. It says, Genesis 2.25, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So when they were created, the text simply points out they were naked and not ashamed. And that's notable. 
They are naked and not ashamed because in a, in a few verses they're going to be naked and they're going to be ashamed. But because there was no sin, there was no need for clothes, there was no need to cover up. Instead, they were just in their natural state. And then in Genesis 3 and verse 7, after they eat of the fruit, it says, Genesis 3, 7, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So when they knew they were naked, there evidently enters some shame. So they decide to try to cover themselves and do the best they can with some fig leaves. Verse 10 this is Adam. He said, I heard the sound of you, God, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So there again, this is a fascinating little text because when Adam says something about being naked, God instantly knows they have eaten from that tree. Now, I'm not saying that because God didn't know it. I'm saying that because there is a natural connection between understanding nakedness and knowing good and evil. So, you know good and evil, something must have changed because that's not where you were when I left you. And so down in verse 21, chapter 321, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. All right, so what do we make out of all of this? I don't think it's about skins and fig leaves and all of that. What I want you to see is there is a connection in the Bible between nakedness and shame. That there needs to be clothing because to be naked in front of everyone is a shameful thing. And that is something that is perpetuated throughout the Bible. This is Genesis, I'm not Genesis, this is Revelation, the other end. Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. That same idea. In fact, very commonly, I didn't want to put all these verses on the board. I'll just put one on the board for you. But very commonly in the prophets, when God wants to talk about humbling the people, he will refer to them as a woman who is shown to be naked and shamed because of that. So, for example, for example Jeremiah 13, 26, I myself will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. That's the, also the reason. Why the law of Moses often talks about sexual sin as, quote, uncovering the nakedness of someone. It's the reason why Ham uncovers Noah's nakedness and is cursed in Genesis 9. It's the reason why when the priests go up to the altar and they're going up above the people, God says, make good underwear for yourselves so that nobody has to look at your nakedness. It's all of that same idea that it's shameful to be naked before others. Now, of course, that's something that is uh, different when we talk about a sexual relationship and marriage. But when we talk about how we present ourselves to the general world, there is a shame associated with nakedness. That is consistent throughout the Bible. So, when we ask the question, what is appropriate, we've got those two, I guess, uh, extremes to work between. We have the one extreme of, of being overdressed and drawing attention to ourselves through so much that we're dressing in. And then we have the other extreme of being underdressed, where we're not fully covered and we're showing our nakedness to others. So when we ask the question, what am I going to wear? We have to ask the question, well, what's appropriate? What, am, I, am I too close to this line or too close to that line? Am I showing off too much? Am I showing off too much by being too ostentatious? Or am I showing off too much by not covering myself fitly enough? The second question we need to ask is, who am I dressing to impress? It's interesting to me, when you think about it, we're almost always thinking about other people when we get dressed. Maybe that's, what do people expect me to wear? What is somebody going to say when they see me in this? What will they say if I'm inappropriately dressed? What will they say if I'm dressed too much? But it also may be whether just generally they're impressed by me. What are people going to think when they see me in this? That's the question that's usually on our minds as we dress ourselves. And I want to show you that there might be some people that we don't want to impress, that we need to think more about what our dress is signaling to them. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4. I'm going to look at a couple of places here. Jeremiah 4. <clears throat> this 
This is Jeremiah 4 and verse 30, where again God is speaking to his people and talking to them as a woman and picturing them as a woman and a woman who is trying to dress up to impress. Jeremiah 4 and verse 30, he says, And you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourself, your lovers despise you, they seek your life. Now notice the understood connection. He's talking about your lovers are the other nations that Jerusalem is trying to impress. But, but notice what he says. You do all of these things to affect your appearance because you want to attract your lovers. You want people to draw attention, to, you want the attention of others, and he says it's not going to work. You're doing this in vain, they can't stand you. But notice that all of that effort is geared towards some direction. All of that work in the dressing is about impressing. And very often, this is what's happening when we get dressed. We are thinking about who we want to impress. The question is, just who is that? Go with me back to Proverbs chapter 7. Back a few books here to Proverbs chapter 7. Just this simple statement, because the Bible also speaks about people who use their dress to attract just anyone. Proverbs 7 and verse 10 says, And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Dressed as a prostitute. Now, I suspect, just like I've said all throughout, I suspect that that's cultural too. What would signal that someone is a prostitute? would be different in each culture, and we would have our own things in our time that would signal to someone that someone is sexually available. But whatever it may be, you see what's happening. The dress communicates something, and it is a deliberate message. The message is sent out that I am available. I want your attention. I welcome your advances. And whatever dress that might be, there is someone they are gearing to impress. I need to talk a little more frankly here. Much of our society, particularly the women in our society, dresses in a way that is sexually provocative. And what I'm trying to say as I read these passages to you is that the message they're communicating is that they are sexually available. That's the message that that kind of dress sends out. Now, there are a variety of ways that that is communicated. Sometimes that's communicated through clothes that don't adequately cover the body. Sometimes it's clothes that are very tight. Sometimes it's clothes that show off the body and just everyday activities. But whatever it is, the focus is on the body, and the message is that I am sexually available. They are interested in drawing sexual attention. I don't know the motives of everyone who does that or why they do that. But I do know what it signals. It signals, and I speak here as a man, it signals that they are sexually available and that they want sexual attention and that they usually get it from the males in their vicinity. Please don't misunderstand me about this. I am not saying that men are not responsible for their part in this. I am not saying that as a Christian man I don't have an obligation to my Lord and to my wife, to discipline my eyes and my body and my thoughts, I do. I am not saying that men are justified in being sexually out of control. I am not saying that men are justified in looking at everything around them and being drawn to everything around them. I also am not saying that men are justified in attempting to act on sexual attention, something that's been aroused in them. I'm just saying that that, all of that is a scene that Christians don't need to be involved in. That's what I'm saying. Men and women. Very often, young women enjoy the attention that comes when they reveal parts of their bodies. And I think there's a disconnect here, and I feel like I have to say this as a Christian teacher. It's not just attention. It's sexual attention. Sexual attention is not innocent. And when you dress this way, it will draw the sexual attention of lots of men. 
Not just the nice boys that you might be interested in, that you might want to notice you. When you would dress, dress to impress sexually, you draw the sexual attention of old men. You draw the sexual attention of young men who are trying to do the right things. You will draw the sexual attention of married men. You will draw the sexual attention of people that you don't even expect, like maybe family members or brothers. You will also draw the sexual attention of creepy men, dangerous men, violent men. And my question is, who are we trying to impress? Now, I'm not saying in any of those situations that men don't have their own responsibilities. They certainly do. I'm asking the question, who am I dressing to impress? Now, contrast everything we have just said with what is said in Proverbs chapter 31. I want you to turn there with me. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31 and verse 30, the very end of this book. Proverbs 31 and verse 30, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Charm fades, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, he says, is to be praised, to be loved by her children and her husband. What is being said here is, that charm and beauty are not the path to finding the life we want. That's not the answer. That's what God is telling us. Those are things that are only temporary, that will just impress just a few people for just a little while. But when we live our lives for the Lord, we have a life worthy of praise. Something we can be thankful for and proud of, instead of something that we can later be ashamed of. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. Who am I dressing to impress? Just what's my goal here? And the third question we need to ask is, what am I saying about my character? Have you noticed? It's a really odd thing. Have you noticed that these passages link dress and character? It's a really funny connection. In fact, it happens here in Proverbs 31. I want you to look. In Proverbs 31, look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. So we're talking about clothes. But then 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. See, she is a woman who fears the Lord. So what she, quote, puts on that matters is strength and dignity and preparedness. She is a hard worker. That's how she dresses herself, so to speak. And that's a fascinating image to me. Do you remember how T Paul stressed this to Timothy, the passage we began with? He says, Likewise also that the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Dress yourself, he says, with good works. What's going on here? What is the connection between our dress and our character? I want you to go with me to 1 Peter 3. I think Peter answers the question. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. It says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Don't let your adorning, he says, be external. Let it be, what he says in verse 4, is the imperishable beauty, the beauty that never fades, of a gentle and quiet spirit. The issue here, and when Peter uses the word adorning, I think he hits on it. The issue here is about how we present ourselves to the world. What is important about me? What is attractive about me? What do you need to know? If you don't know anything else about me, what do you need to know? 
Do you need to know what I look like? Do you need to know how much money I have? Do you need to know how charming I am? Or do you need to know what kind of works I do? Do you need to know what kind of person I am? And what Peter is saying is how you present yourself to the world needs to be not about what you're wearing. How you present yourself to the world needs to be about the kind of man or woman you really are. What am I saying about my character and how is my dress reflecting that? Now, when you ask the question, well, what's attractive about me or what matters about me? In Peter and Paul's day, it's pretty clear that that question was answered by the, the surrounding culture by saying, I can wear fancy clothes and be physically attractive because of how nice I look. Sometimes we still wrestle with that. In our day, though, primarily, that question is answered by drawing attention to physical attractiveness through revealing clothes. And that is what most of our society tells us. You matter, particularly as a woman, if you look good and can show everyone your body. And what God is saying is that what matters about God's people has nothing to do with their bodies. What matters about God's people is the kind of character that they have. So, Peter talks about adorning. It is the word that means to order yourself. So just picture it. You're looking in the mirror. You're getting ready for the day. You're thinking about all these things. What's appropriate? Who am I dressing to impress? You're thinking about other people. You're thinking about the situations you're going to be in. And Peter says, don't forget, as you look in the mirror, you fix everything up, this is not what matters about you. This is not who you are. Don't forget, as you get ready for the day, that what matters is not what you look like today, but what you do today. Don't forget, this is not who you are. And if we can dress with that thought in mind, we probably won't be nearly as worried when a hair is out of place, when we cut ourselves shaving, if it happens to you as much as it does to me, or if we fail to accentuate our best features, we have some kind of blemish. As I prepare for the day, what I need to be thinking about is how am I going to do good works today? What is my character going to say today? I'm going to think about how much God loves me and is going to use me today. Now, a couple of thoughts before we're done. First, I want to remind you, Paul's instructions seem to me to be addressed to Christians as they gather to worship. That as we worship, we don't want our dress to be a distraction to one another. Peter's instructions seem to me to be about everyday life. When you combine those together, it seems to me to be saying that no matter where we are or where we are going, these rules need to be a part of our thinking and how we dress ourselves. So it's not different when we gather for worship. We still need to be concerned. But it's also not different when we're outside of worship. We still need to be concerned. Second, and I want you to hear me, please. We need to be prepared for the fact that other people are not going to see these questions in the same way we do. And that goes in both directions. Sometimes somebody might think that I am dressed inappropriately. And they may be right, even though I may disagree. Sometimes, though, I might think that other people are dressed inappropriately. And I might be wrong. Because what we have seen is that these are principles laid down in Scripture that we're going to have to wrestle with and apply for ourselves. The likelihood that we will agree about every little question of dress is extremely small, especially across generations, as there are different views in the different generations. But if we are sincerely thinking about these questions, if we are prepared to have these discussions and to have respect for the opinions of a brother or sister, it may be that we need to reconsider what we feel is appropriate. But I ask that we can all have some patience with one another about this as we try to live out what God calls us to in dress. Would you pray with me about that? Our Father, we thank you so much for the time you've given us this morning to open up your word and to think about 
how we are going to present ourselves both before you and before the world. Father, I pray for wisdom for each one of us as we think about these issues, as we try to apply your word to our lives, as we try to live in the way that you've led us to through your word. Father, I pray that you'll bless this local church with peace and harmony as we work together. I pray that you'll be with us, men and women. I pray that you will help us to have the kind of character you want us to have, to make good choices about our dress. I pray that you'll help us to be disciplined in how we look at others and think about others. And Father, I pray that all of our behavior will go to glorify you. We thank you so much, Father, for the love that you've shown for us in revealing your word and in sending your son to die for us. We ask that you'll bless us as we try to show our love for you in every area of our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Might be someone here this morning who needs to respond to the gospel. We have this time set aside as an opportunity for you to make your needs known. If you are ready to become a disciple of Jesus, to leave behind your sin and to be washed in his blood, have your sins washed away. We would love nothing more than to help you to become a child of God this morning. If you need to do that, if there's any need you have, please come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.